Hey guys, welcome to Savvy Saps Podcast. I'm your host, Sabrina Salvati. In 2019, my special guest became the youngest African-American mayor in the country. His name is Colin Byrd, and he is now running for U.S. Senate to represent the state of Maryland. Hi, Colin. Hey, good evening to you. Thank you so much for having me. It's a beautiful day. So before we dive into your campaign, can you tell everybody a little bit about your background and why you decided to run for office? Sure. So uh, I'm from Prince George's County, Maryland. I was born in D.C. from Prince George's County, Maryland. Uh, And, um, you know, just in addition to what you said in terms of when I became mayor, I also served on the Greenbelt City Council prior to that. Uh, beginning in 2017 and if we just trace the if we just you know hit rewind a little bit how this all started for me is really uh you know it's born out of my activism uh born out of a little bit of good trouble here there here and there um and 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 the way that that good trouble manifests itself was really in three areas uh, in my early adult life uh, in my formative years if you will which which in some ways i guess i'm still in but one is racial justice, two is, is environmental justice, and three is labor justice. Uh, with respect to racial justice, there were two incidents that happened as, as I was getting a little older and starting to kind of come into my own from a standpoint of activism and, and politics. And, and number one, it was the killing of Trayvon Martin and all of the injustice in and around that in Sanford, Sanford Florida. Uh, we started looking at stuff like staying your ground laws and just just trying to make sense of the fact that in America, a young man could literally be minding his own business, walking in his own neighborhood, coming from a convenience store in his own neighborhood and, and, and to be hounded like that by Mr. Zimmerman and receive zero justice on the back. And that was that was incredibly frustrating to me. And it was very dismaying. And it and of course, that was part of the beginnings of the so-called Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, which which I, I, I greatly appreciate because I think that's a phrase that we need to embrace and I think that's a movement we need to embrace. So that's number one. Number two was the killing of Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri. Now, those are not the only two issues that we've seen around racial justice in America by any stretch of imagination. You know, we can take off the names, uh, say their names, say his names, say her name. We can do that, but those incidents and the injustices around them really really piqued my interest and not even so much interest but just made me realize I cannot be on the sidelines when it comes to the fight against racism in America because if we are on the sidelines we're going to continue to get slaughtered so that was the racial justice piece I became head of government relations for the NAACP at the University of Maryland College Park chair of social advocacy for the Black Student Union became Mr. Black Student Union was humbled and grateful as well to to really uh to really work with people of all different backgrounds, men, women, everything in between in terms of you know different identities uh, on on issues and and that kind of brings me to those other two pieces, which was labor justice, environmental justice. With respect to labor justice, I, I began to organize with a group called Student Labor Action Project. They were looking at stuff like the minimum wage on campus. Uh, and various other worker conditions <laughs> issues. Uh, and then finally, uh, environmental justice. My first paying job, believe it or not, was with an organization called Environment in Maryland. We really started to look at stuff around combating climate change in general, and in particular, uh, in particular protecting the Chesapeake Bay and other uh, precious natural resources in Maryland. So I, I say all that to say that that brings us to where we are today, because, you know, in, in my interactions with elected officials around that time, I, I began to realize that the way that they think about service is totally different in the way that, I'm sorry, the way they think about politics is totally different in the way I think about it, totally different than what I think it needs to be by and large. And so uh, I would see people just ignore people, ignore uh, activists, ignore uh, the power of the people uh, and, and, and really prioritize the people in power that was offensive to me, that was dismaying to me, and I knew something had to be done about it. Now, initially, my, my thought thinking on it was not necessarily to run for office myself, but I knew that I had a, a great level of dissatisfaction with those in office. So I made a commitment that I would not be passive 
a passive bystander in the American political game, that I would try to support those that are like-minded and, and not uh, blindly support those who are not like-minded. And, you know, eventually what ended up happening was people encouraged me to run. And he said, look, man, you got a whole lot of thoughts, you got a whole lot of ideas, but as long as you're on this side of the fence, you're going to continue to have those frustrations. Now, that's not to say that today I don't have those frustrations, but sometimes I can channel those frustrations into public policy in a way that I can if I'm on the other side. So I was encouraged to run for city council, encouraged to run uh, and become mayor, and, and, and frankly, humbled and grateful to be encouraged to run for U.S. Senate. Uh, and so that, that kind of is, is and, 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 and that, that, I think I said a lot, but I probably didn't say much in terms of the, the, the background piece. So I, I'll leave it at that for now. So you are running against Chris Van Hollen. Uh, when you look at his time in office, where would you say you feel that he is underperformed? So, so first of all, all of this, uh, all of the way I look at our federal representatives in general, whether it's the U.S. Senate or Congress, all of this really stems from my, you know, the the leadership that I've 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 been thrust into, not only as mayor in general, but particularly as a mayor during the COVID nineteen pandemic, during the height of the Black Lives Matter movement, you know, particularly in the wake of Floyd, et cetera, right, Breonna Taylor, et cetera. Uh, and in fact, Kentucky Derby, I think, is today one of the horses, I guess they said, is a tribute to Breonna Taylor. But I digress. Look, the, the issues really all stem from that for me. There are other things we can get into, but for me, it has to do with that. So I'll give you a great example. Look at the stimulus bills. The first stimulus bill, the CARES Act, uh, it provided, it, it did a number of good things, and, and including providing state and local government aid. Uh, to, to, to state governments, local jurisdictions like counties. But here's the problem, and this is something that not a lot of people are mindful of, but as a mayor, I'm extraordinarily mindful of. In that bill, they provided state and local government aid, but they left, o- left out over 99.9% of municipalities in America. Over the 99.9% of the cities and towns in America were left out of that bill that bill only took care of big cities like New York, Boston, et cetera. And by the way, I love New York and Boston. But when you look at most cities in America, most cities in America fall far short of the threshold that was covered by that bill. And that would include cities like Greenbelt. Uh, that would include, you know, small to medium sized cities really throughout the entire state of Maryland. There are very few that would that were eligible for direct aid under the CARES Act. And, I was very concerned that as that was happening, we had in Senator Van Hollen, an individual that would go on the Senate floor and push for more aid to go to D.C. rather than fight for the cities and towns in Maryland that weren't getting a dime directly from the federal government as part of the Fair CARES Act. Uh, he was literally on the Senate floor saying D.C. is not getting enough money. And by the way, I agree with him. D.C. should have gotten more money in the CARES Act. D.C. should be a state, and I support those efforts. But the challenge is this. As a U.S. senator from the state of Maryland, his focus should have been, could have been, on Maryland's municipalities. It wasn't. That was a concern. That's number one. Number two, in this most recent stimulus bill, so many different issues came out of that, uh, including the fact that the U.S. Senate in particular stripped the minimum wage out of the bill. The $15 minimum wage, that was the U.S. Senate. He didn't do what he needed to do on that issue. That U.S. Senate also lowered weekly unemployment benefits. Yep. And here's the biggest thing. Uh, here's the biggest thing. I want to make sure I, 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 I underline this. I put a pen in this. They promised $2,000 stimulus check, turned around, shorted the American people $600, and sent $1,400 stimulus check. Now, that may not mean a lot to him, it may not even mean a lot to you, but I can tell you within my city, within this state, there are so many Marylanders and Green Belters, Prince Georgians, who were absolutely floored that they were campaign promising that Senate Democrats would deliver on $2,000 checks and within weeks, within months, flip on that and say $1,400. So I can tell you that that was a big deal. And then there are local issues that really gave me concerns about Senator Van Hollen like this issue of the Magla may not mean a lot to national audience, but I can tell you in my city, we just had a rally today. In fact, this is a project that would devastate the people of Greenbelt, devastate the people people of 
Prince George's County, devastate our schools, devastate our parks, devastate our forests, devastate NASA, uh, devastate the NSA, dev not that I like the NSA, by the way, but <laughs> devastate the protection research reserve and, and wildlife issues. Um, and, 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 I, and I highlight this because this is one of those things that happens where big money drowns out the voices of local, local communities and in particular black and brown communities. This project is all, this train is all pain and no gain. We have a US Senator that's not opposed to maglev. I would oppose the maglev, I would stop it. But again, the big money is on the other side and it seems like that's what the Senate is listening to. So that's just a snippet into it. There's other things we can get into, but I can tell you, if you're coming up short in the pandemic, you're coming up short on local development issues that impact my community, that have a federal jurisdiction, which is the maglev, because that's being reviewed by the US Department of Transportation, and in particular, the Federal Railroad Administration. And by the way, the cherry on top is this man hasn't done anywhere near what he needs to do on vaccine equity. Uh, we're gonna have a problem, because that's a problem for the people of Green Butter, the people of Prince George's County. So those are some of my concerns, but there's other things we could get into, and, and I'm happy to elaborate. I give great, another great example. Uh, Senator Van Hollen supported the U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement. That was a Trump trade deal that was negotiated last year, and it was bad on multiple fronts. One, it was terrible when it came to combating climate change. It didn't do anything on carbon emissions that would be satisfactory. Uh, and it also didn't do what it needed to do when it comes to prescription drug prices and, and making it so that folks can get lower prescription drugs, lower price prescription drugs, uh, from Canada and that type of import issue. That was a big failure. And again, this was him siding with the Trump administration on a, on a bill that was even opposed by folks like Chuck Schumer uh, and more importantly, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez because it didn't address climate change and prescription drug prices. So, you know, we can go down the line of different things that, 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 that I think he's underperformed on. Um, even, um, even, even Senate confirmations you know the senate has a particularly special role when it comes to confirming or voting on con confirming nominees he voted for tom bilsack to be the head of the agriculture department and if you know anything about uh, tom bilsack he's pro he's pro big corporate agriculture and he's anti-black farm as mm -hmm. a black man and descendant of black slaves in america that's offensive to me that he would vote for that man especially when we know that there are other senators who decided not to vote for him, including U.S. Senator Bernie Sanders. Folks knew what time it was with this guy. He was opposed by all of the major civil rights groups in America. But you know what? Senator Van Hollen supported him in spite of that, maybe even because of that. What would you say, um, from, from your experience going off of that, what would you say, what issues are important to African-Americans in your community? There, there are issues that, that matter, I look, right now, you got COVID-19, you got vaccination equity. Uh, you also have just the general healthcare issues in America, right? Senator Van Hollen has never co-sponsored Medicare for All, for example, right? That's a big issue, right? Because we know that Obamacare did a lot of great things. Pre-existing conditions did a lot of great things. But if we're very candid, which we need to be, particularly now in light of this pandemic, we know that it falls short when it comes to covering millions of individuals who continue to remain uninsured. It's just a fact, right? Uh, big, big pharma and, and, the, and, and, and the big insurance companies are continuing to make money hand over fist on the backs of those who are sick and shut in. That's just a fact. That's a fact that we can't accept. That's a fact that we must change by changing policy. It's just a reality of the situation on healthcare. Um, but beyond healthcare, obviously issues of food equity, uh, issues of, of housing, uh, issues of, of transportation. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and all of these issues, by the way, are, are issues that matter to all Americans, but they do have disproportionately negative impacts. Uh, from a historical and even present standpoint on a black and brown uh, communities. Um, and, so, and so those are some of the issues that I think matter a lot. I think there's another issue that doesn't get talked about much and that is a pay for college athletes, right? That, that is an issue that it, it rarely gets talked about in mainstream American political discourse, but here's the reality. 
Uh, when you look at um, particular NCAA football and basketball, you have an institution that is robbing Black families of billions of dollars in generational wealth over a four-year period. And that, that, again, is something that doesn't get talked about much, but when we look at the impacts of it and who it hurts and who it helps, it's clear that this is as well a racial issue. I mean, another big issue, reparations. We absolutely need that. That deals with the economic issue. The racial wealth gap in America is, is, is insane. It's obscene. Mm -hmm. And every year it gets, it, it gets more and more frustrating to, to look at the fact that this country would enslave a population for, for hundreds of years, allow that, promote that, perpetuate that, and turn around and say, you know what? Uh, we're good. We're good. There's nothing that needs to be done to atone for that, to reconcile for that, or to compensate for that. Uh, that is offensive, and that is inconsistent with the historical and present record on on economics. So, I mean, there's a lot of things we can get into. Uh, you know, there, there's a lot of things we can get into, but I, I will have to be candid that I think a lot of it starts with the, the racial wealth gap. Mm -hmm. um, and there's things that stem from that including education, right? You know, HBCUs, they need to be treated way better, way, way better. We, 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 so there's a lot of things that we could get into, but those are some of the things that I would say off the top of my head are, 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 um, are priorities for, for African-Americans in, in, in my community and in our community, if you will. I can tell you with public uh, transportation, no matter where I've lived, it's been an issue where even here in Boston, when it comes to public transportation, it is limited in African-American neighborhoods. And it's ridiculous. People have to, kids have to take three buses just to get to school. That's, that's uncalled for. There's, there's no excuse for that. On your website, there's a quote that says, change can't wait, change needs to be big, and change needs to be bold. I 100% agree. When you look at the current administration, the 15 minimum wage ordeal, the stimulus package, all of the things that they're offering like to us, do you feel that it has been bold and why or why not? First, let me just let me just piggyback on what you said about public transportation, because there's a very specific example of something that I want to point to as it as it relates to this race, but just in general issues facing Marylanders. Because believe it or not, I, I'm I'm not so much I'm I'm less political than people might assume. I, I I'm much more interested in actually raising the issues and, and addressing the issue than I am in scoring cheap political points. And so I'll tell you about an issue on which the senator and I actually may agree, but I think we did disagree on tactics, and that makes all of the difference. So, for example, uh, there's a public transportation project called the Red Line that the Republican governor of Maryland, Larry Hogan, canceled as soon as he came in office. Now, I've written to Senator Van Hollen. Again, we, we agree that the red line is a good thing, but we disagree in terms of priority and in terms of tactics. I think that the, 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 the infrastructure bill needs to explicitly include the red line in it. And I also think that the senator should be pressing the U.S. Department of Transportation, headed by Secretary Pete Buttigieg, some call him Mayor Pete, some call him Mayo Pete, I'm not going to get into that conversation, but here's the thing that, that, that project was canceled by our governor. And what he did was he shifted the, the funding that was uh, planned for that project to uh, white communities for highway projects. Uh, and what ended up happening was what we saw was really the violation of Baltimorean civil rights. This is a project, by the way, red line, would have connected Woodlawn to Bayview, connected people to jobs, connected people to economic opportunities. And it really would have been a boon for Baltimore's residents. And of course, as we know, Baltimore is a diverse city. Uh, it's a diverse region. Plenty of Black folks, plenty of Brown folks. And in particular, this project would have disproportionately impacted Black folks in a positive way. The cancellation, by, com by, by, by contrast, disproportionately impacts Black folks in a negative way. Uh, so. You know, the difference between me and the senator on that is I, I think that needs to be a priority. Uh, I'm not sure that he does. But I also think that in addition to actually getting the red line done, there needs to be an investigation opened up by Secretary Buttigieg, 
a civil rights investigation reopened into the cancellation of the project because the governor and his administration have to be held accountable. If governors are not held accountable for racist transportation policy, that only makes it more likely that in the future, that governor or another governor will engage in. But if they're held accountable, folks will think twice and they'll try to make things right on the front end rather than wait uh, wait to say sorry on the back end. So, so I just want to say that. Now, you, you, you asked me about the change can't wait thing. Look, one of the things that I've said since I got into this is I said, look, I believe in the audacity of progressives. What you describe on, on my website is a description of the audacity of progressives. The audacity of progressives is the belief that change can't wait. Change has to be big. Change has to be bold. And, and I got the notion of the audacity of progressives. This is kind of a play on what Obama used to talk about which was the audacity of hope. He used to talk about reclaiming the American dream, but the audacity of progressives is to say, hey, look, I, I believe in hope, nothing wrong with it. Hope is a good thing. Um, I believe, you know, that there is some notion of the American dream that we should try to claim or reclaim, however you, how, whatever the case may be. But that is not enough. The hope is not enough. The, dream, the American dream is not enough. And look, for too long in America, we've had people focusing on American dream when too many people in America have been living the American nightmare. We've talked about some of those issues, poverty, lack of transportation, lack of health care, a uh, lack of food, uh, you know, lack of housing, uh, lack of the basic necessities of life. And so when we talk about, uh, you know, whether the change that we've seen in these stimulus bills has been big enough or bold enough mm -hmm. uh, or quick enough, um, you know, the answer is this, it's, it's not, it's not a simple answer. I, I think, look, what we've seen with these bills is, is stuff that we have never seen before. And we've seen a lot of good things, right? They did at least provide some stimulus checks, right? Uh, but again, they trimmed the eligibility, right? And they, and they lowered the, the amount from 2000 to 1400. We did see some weekly unemployment benefits enhanced. But again, they had lowered that once it got to the U.S. Senate side. We did see conversation about the minimum wage, but we didn't actually see implementation or enactment of the increased minimum wage. So I believe that, you know, we've seen, we've gotten a taste. You know, if you ever been to the mall, right, you know, <laughs> outside of a pandemic, they're handing out samples. And what we've gotten in this pandemic is we've gotten samples of policy, public policy that tastes good, but we need more of, right? We haven't gotten the full meal. We get a stimulus check here and there, but we haven't gotten universal basic income. We haven't gotten those recurring monthly stimulus checks that give folks not just a sigh of relief, but ongoing assurance that they're not gonna, that the bottom, the bottom is not gonna fall out on them, that they're not gonna miss their bills. Uh, whether it's rent or, or utilities or anything else. So we've gotten a taste, but the change hasn't been big enough or sustained enough uh, that we can get more than a taste, that we can get the real deal. Um, and that's on so many issues, even in this last stimulus bill on healthcare. You know, they did a few things to temporarily uh, solve some of the issues associated with Obamacare or shall we say the Affordable Care Act. But again, until we get that permanent Medicare for all, we are still going to have a scores of Americans suffering from skyrocketing health care costs and, and also um, from a lack of health care, right? That's just a reality. And we can go down the line of, of, of where kind of the, the Band-Aid the band solutions have been provided when what we need is much more, uh, something much bigger and something much bolder to, to stem the bleeding long term. I want to get your opinion about policing in America. I actually just mm -hmm. did a video with someone about this, but mm -hmm. uh, given the recent verdict with the Derek Chauvin trial mm -hmm. and everything going on with Michaela Bryant, and now we have Andrew Brown Jr. in North Carolina, in, in your opinion and from your experience, what do you feel needs to be done to fix policing in America? You know, you know, when, when, when you see a debate on TV and a presidential debate, you know, or even when you watch the Sunday shows, 
there's a temptation to provide these 30 second sound bites. And I can tell you that when it comes to policing in America, there's really no 30 second sound bite that that's going to at all be sufficient for this conversation. But I can tell you in in as brief a statement as I can, you know, as is feasible that in policing, the biggest things that I'm looking at is I think that policing in America has to be significantly more transparent and significantly more accountable. I mean, we still waiting for body camera footage in, the, in some of these cases, right? That's a transparency issue. We know that there are officers, for example, who, um, you know, have long rap sheets long before they get to the point of killing somebody or, you know, otherwise severely brutalizing somebody. And so there's a transparency issue when officer misconduct records in most states in America are completely secret. Right. We're, we're starting to turn the tide in Maryland. There, there was a bill that was passed called Anton's Law in this past legislative session named after Anton Black, a young black man who was killed on the eastern shore here in Maryland. And, and part of the conversation that came out of that is this, this officer just had so much so much of a rap sheet and so many other officers have these long rap sheets. But, you know, you can't see them. And so because you can't see them, it's difficult for the public to know who's who, what's what. So transparency is is one one big thing. Uh, you can't have accountability without transparency, but transparency without accountability um, is also a problem. And so, you know, in addition, I think everywhere in this country, you got to repeal everywhere where this exists. You got to repeal what's called the Law Enforcement Officers Bill of Rights. It is it is at least in the case of Maryland, it's the single biggest impediment to police accountability, it makes it harder to discipline officers, harder to fire them, harder to investigate them. But of course, beyond that, there's so many other issues, particularly around use of force, right? And, 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 and you know, one of the things that I'm looking at, particularly as somebody interested in the U.S. Senate is, look, we need to pack the Supreme Court and ultimately get uh, get some of these Supreme Court rulings overturned. There was a 1989 U.S. Supreme Court ruling that is that is not well known, but that is extraordinarily impactful when it comes to police uh, violence. And that was Graham v. Graham v. Connor, if I recall correctly. Uh, and this was a case that basically basically says, "Hey, look, if it's a, a juries and judges should not second guess." the split second decision, the so-called split second decisions of officers, right? Now, now, don't get me wrong. I think that there there are some scenarios in which, you know, use of force and even the lethal use of force may, may be necessary, uh, you know, in terms of an officer's use of force. Um, I think that those are fairly rare, um, but they, they, they do exist. Here's the bigger problem, though. Under Graham v. Connor, pretty much everybody, look, with extremely rare exceptions, you have situations where officers are given the benefit of the doubt, even when evidence is presented to a jury or to a judge, to the contrary, that they did not need to kill somebody, that there was no imminent threat uh, to their life, but yet they, they took another individual's life. And again, this Graham v. Connor was sweeping. It was, it was, it was. Look, if, if folks are concerned about the impact of Citizens United on the 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 fragility of our democracy, you have to be concerned if you care about Black Lives Matter about Graham v. Connor and the impact on that on the fragility of Black life in America, particularly when Black individuals or frankly brown brown individuals or any other Americans come into contact with law enforcement officials. So those are not the only things to be candid with you. But again, transparency, accountability and making sure that use of force is reasonable and not just, you know, uh, unlimited uh, when it comes to officers. Those are things that I think need to be done. And then I guess the other thing that I, I'll, I'll touch on is, of course, there needs to be a, re, a reimagination of, of, of the scope and the different iterations of public safety. I think Historically in America, we've looked at pol uh, policing as the end-all, be-all of public safety. 
And I think most of us are starting to come to the conclusion that, hey, look, there are other things that need to be done structurally in a society to, to make it so that a community is safer, whether it's education or economic um, or, you know, housing or whatever it is, whatever the case may be. And then also we need to be looking at mental health as something that, that can be addressed um, as part of some of the calls that, that tend to come in as so-called emergencies or crises, right? We have officers responding to things for which they are not trained to respond to. And sometimes those situations, in fact, oftentimes those situations escalate to somebody uh, suffering bodily harm or mistreatment or misconduct. Yep. All right, Colin, I have one more question for you. Mm -hmm. How can people get involved in your campaign? Well, thank you for the question. Uh, and it's been a pleasure. Uh, you know, look, there's there's a number of different ways. I always try to tell folks that as a mayor, particularly as a mayor of a, of a city the size of the jurisdiction of Greenbelt, I always think it's important for me to be close to the people and accessible. So one thing I will share is my phone number is 301-957-5014. Again, that's 301-957-5014. People can literally get me direct. Uh, also, email colinabird at gmail.com. Again, that's C-O-L-I-N-A-B-Y-R-D at gmail.com. Uh, beyond that, you can hit me on Twitter at twitter.com slash mayorbird, at mayorbird, uh, and that's bird with a Y. Uh, on Facebook at vote colon bird. On Facebook at vote colon bird. And then, of course, you mentioned uh, you referenced earlier my website, and that website, of course, again, is uh, Colenberg for Senate.com. Again, that's Colenberg for Senate.com, F O R Senate.com. So, uh, between all of the above, you should be able to get a hold of me if you <laughs> want to reach me directly. Um, and short of that, you can also, of course, find ways to support, including volunteering uh, and, and donating. And, you know, a wise man once said that. Uh, vision is great, but vision without money is hallucination. Help me to not hallucinate about my prospects in this election. Help me to have the money that we can, I'm sorry, that we need to, own, to be viable, effective, and ultimately successful. Everyone, I'll be sure to put all of Colin's links in the description below. Colin, thanks so much for coming on today. This was very, very informative. Oh, it was my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me, uh, Ms. Savian. You have a great rest of the day.